And I'm going to be floating a little bit back and forth. Like I said, I'm using two computers. Um, kind of the big thing in taking a look at the budget for next year, the 2021-22 budget, um, is I'm going to start with the bottom line, you know, what people can expect to pay, what the increases they can expect to see in terms of their taxes, because that's what most people are usually interested in. And then I'll kind of go through and I'll explain a little bit um, for those that have a little bit more interest in uh, Vermont tax law, um, you know, how we actually get to that bottom line. So bottom line, and this has actually changed uh, since some of the earlier presentations um, because things looked a lot rosier uh, after we initially had to kind of talk about the budget uh, with the school board um, in terms of the education fund. There was a significant amount of money that uh, flowed into the education fund this year despite COVID that people did not expect. And so it's made for a little bit rosier outlook. And so the bottom line for all three towns um, is that the school budget, uh, as it currently stands and based upon what's working its way through uh, the, the legislature um, in terms of property yields right now, is going to add about 1.5 cents per hundred dollars of assessed value of people's property. So to kind of break that down a little bit, if you've got uh, a home of average value in Vermont of $275,000, the average school tax increase that you're going to see is going to be 41 bucks, which is about 341 a month. And the other piece to, to be aware of uh, for the taxpayers that are out there is that Vermont has a sensitivity income threshold. If you are below that threshold, and I believe it's $95,000 for the household for this year, um, you can fill out an additional form when you're doing your Vermont taxes um, so that you qualify for this and it will reduce uh, your school property taxes. Um, so it's important to kind of look out for this. Now, a um, couple of things to be aware of, uh, and I'm going to do this as kind of a preview, kind of a pre-teaching, so that when we get to it again a little bit later in the presentation, it may make a little bit more sense to people. Um, in terms of tax rates, you've got your tax rates and you've got your actual tax bill, which is the money that you pay for your taxes. There are really two things that go into determining what your tax rate and your tax bill are. Um, the first is what happens with the school budget. Obviously, if the school budget increases, then people end up paying a little bit more, your tax rates go up. Um, and you do pay a little bit more when that happens in terms of the check that you write out to pay your property, school property taxes with. Um, there are fluctuations that happen also in tax rates uh, when it comes to school property taxes um, that are based on something a little bit different that don't have as much of an impact on what you actually pay. They have a huge impact on tax rates, um, but a very, very small impact on what you actually pay when you pay your tax bill. Um, one of the things that I'm going to keep coming back to is that uh, what you pay for your town taxes, there's a different process for that than what you pay for your school property taxes. Um, school property taxes are based upon the fair market value of homes in a town, right? And so that's established with what they call this equalization study that occurs every year. And so what happens um, is they take a look at, you know, what the homes are selling in the town and they say, okay, based upon this, then, you know, in that town, the, the home value is X. And that value can be above or below what the town has assessed you to be at. And they determine your property taxes based upon that fair market value. And now you'll see these wild fluctuations sometimes in um, school property tax rates uh, based upon what happens from year to year in fair market values. In the case of all three of our towns, um, the fair market values have dropped um, from last year to this year. And what happens is when those market values go down, the state will increase the tax rates. But the two balance each other out. One goes down, one goes up, so that in the end, these changes mean that you're paying about the same as you paid in the previous year. Another way to kind of think about this is, is it's like this. Yep, your, your tax rates went up because of, of these fluctuations in, in fair market value. They went up, um, so you're paying more on the value of your home 
but the value of your home has gone down. And when you put those two together, things come out to be equal. Um, so the important thing to take away from that long-winded discussion here is this idea that the actual increase that you are going to see in your taxes, if you have a home of average value, is about $41 um, for the school year. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. And I've got some slides that go into an incredible amount of detail on this a little bit later in the presentation. In terms of uh, the Orange Southwest School District school budget goal um, for 2021, 2022, and actually for all the years that come after that, um, as far, far as we can see right now, the goal is to move into what's called the level service budget. Um, the town was great. Uh, in the past couple of years, uh, they provided some big increases uh, to the school budget, which allowed us to build some significant structures that we needed to really go after improving academic achievement in mathematics and science and, and English, um, as well as to revamp the special education uh, department um, so that we're providing better services to students so that students are coming off IEPs. Um, and so the community has given us everything that we need. Um, in terms of that work, which is awesome. And so it's appropriate at this time to move over to this idea of a level service budget. Level service budget is one in which there are no new funds being asked for. Level service budget does not um, mean um, that you know the, the school budget isn't going up. It means that the budget only increases enough to cover inflation and other mandated obligations so that we're able to provide the same programs and services that we did in the previous year. You know, and if you think about it, right, the cost of materials goes up a little bit every year um, because of inflation. Um, the cost of the benefits that we provide to staff that we're contractually obligated to provide to the staff um, increase every year, like health insurance, you know, went up 10%. Um, and then the staff contracts themselves with the teachers and with the support staff, um, with the bus drivers, the contracts themselves through negotiations actually spell out the increases um, that we give them in terms of their pay uh, from year to year. And so um, those are the things that will cause a level service budget to increase. They're mandated, they're mandatory, they're not within our control. Um, we are not adding anything new to the budget above and beyond those mandatory items. We can talk about those a little bit, um, right? In moving from this current school year uh, to the next school year, um, there is a $523,000 increase, um, and those are those mandatory budget items, right? We don't have a choice in them. They must be added to the dist district budget to maintain our current level of services. Um, if you look at the arrows, right, there are three things that are adding up to 98% of that $523,000. Um, that's the estimate we had to put in for um, where negotiations are going to land with the teachers in terms of uh, their salaries for next year. Um, that includes a 10% increase uh, to health insurance. And there are other benefits that the staff get, like dental insurance and long-term disability insurance, and those go up a little bit from year to year as well. So 98% of that $523,000 um, is mandatory um, contractual obligations. We've got to do it. And then about 2% of what's there um, is due to inflation, uh, uh, right? Inflation causes the cost of the supplies and the services that we get um, to go up a little bit every year. So even though we're not adding anything new, right? The cost increases from year to year. We've all experienced that in our own personal lives. Um, that happens with schools too. Now, comparing current year, right, 2020-21, um, that's the budget that folks voted in last year that we're currently living under. And comparing it to 2021-22, um, what you'll see highlighted in yellow is what the district is asking for from taxpayers through the education fund. Um, this current year, you know, we asked for $19.7 million um, from the taxpayers um, that, that folks voted in. Um, and then next year, you can actually see that it's gone down a little bit. Next year, it's 19.4 million, um, which is a reduction of 1.54% that we're asking from the taxpayers, uh, 1.54 to 1.56. Now, we created this reduction um, by using surplus money. So at the end of most school years, we have money that is unspent at the end of the fiscal year. And so we have some designs, which I'm gonna explain a little bit 
about what we're going to do with that surplus money to help reduce the burden on taxpayers. So one of the questions that we've got to ask um, in terms of the surplus money that's going to help us out for a couple of years is, is where did it come from and why, why we're needing to use it at this time. A year ago, um, when COVID closed down the district, we realized really quickly the negative impact that pandemic would have on the state's ability to generate tax revenues, right? Um, and those tax revenues, right, if they go down, it reduces the amount of money flowing into the education fund, um, which means there's less money in the fund to support education, so the money's gotta come from elsewhere. So one of the ways of thinking about it is if you think about a school budget as a fixed cost, and you think of the education fund as the checking account that you use to pay for that cost, if the money flowing into the checking account decreases, right, because of COVID, um, and there isn't enough to pay the bill, the state's got to scramble around um, and find more money elsewhere to make up that difference. In, in this scenario, um, the local taxpayers here are that elsewhere. Um, you know, we're the ones that will be expected to make up that, that, that difference. So recognizing that there was probably gonna be an increased burden on local taxpayers um, due to the decrease in, in tax revenues flowing into that ed fund, what we did is, is we pulled out all stops to create the biggest surplus that we could um, at the end of the last year so that it could be used to subsidize budgets in the coming years. Um, reminder, surplus money is money that is left unspent at the end of the budget year. So at the end of last year, um, we did a couple of things to try to maximize what that surplus was going to be. We froze spending in March, right? Remember in mid-March, uh, the schools uh, moved to remote session. Um, and so any spending that was unnecessary um, because of that move, we froze. Um, that way we didn't spend the money. We had it available at the end of the year. We had also budgeted for a number of programs, um, primarily athletics, um, that due to COVID, they just couldn't run. So we had budgeted for them. They didn't run. So that money was available to go into the surplus. And then I give uh, my business management team a, a tremendous amount of credit um, because we really went hard after all the federal money we could get our hands on um, in terms of reimbursements and whatnot to try to max out this, uh, this, this year end surplus. And what we ended up with is uh, over $1.6 million uh, in unspent money at the end of last year that we can now use um, to subsidize um, school budgets, which means reducing the burden that our local taxpayers have. And um, we have enough there to do it for three years um, while the state's economy recovers. Um, so it was a lot of, a lot of good work on behalf of, of the staff, uh, the teachers here, as well as the, the, the business office, really pulling out all stops to make this happen. And the big thing um, that we are doing with that $1.6 million um, is we want to be able to use it over three years. Um, and so what we've done already, because the law allows us to do this, is we've already taken half of that $1.6 million, right? You see it down there in the green, 826,342 bucks. We've taken half of that $1.6 million and we've already applied it towards next year's budget. And so if you look at the two boxes, what it's showing you is that without using that surplus money, we would have to ask for $20.2 million from the taxpayers. Being able to use um, this part of the surplus money next year reduces what we're asking for from the taxpayers from 20.2 million down to 19.4 million. So it's a significant decrease. Um, it's actually less than we asked uh, from the taxpayers last year. Kind of uh, look into the future. Um, when we were setting up this plan and building up this surplus, um, you know, the discussions at the time were uh, it's probably going to take a couple of years um, for the state's economy to recover and for tax revenues uh, that they generate to return to normal. And so we really kind of built this plan um, around subsidizing uh, the school budgets for the next three years. Um, so during, you know, this time, the district's going to seek to reduce those tax burdens um, by using this giant surplus we were able to create 
um, to make sure that we're reducing the burden on taxpayers. Because we recognize that you guys really stepped to the plate for us in the previous couple of years to allow us to build the structures that we needed to advance learning. Um, so what this kind of looks at looks like um, is this is right in this first year here we've already applied half of the surplus money to next year's budget we can automatically do that so we've done it um, the goal is to take the remaining half of that surplus money and split it equally to help subsidize the 2022-23 and 2023-24 school budgets right again we're all set uh, for next year but we are unable to use the remaining surplus money in the following two years without the voters help. I'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. What needs to happen um, is we really need the voters to help us um, by approving a place uh, for us to put the second half of the surplus money to hold it until the budget years in which it will be used, right? So next year we can automatically um, apply it to the budget. State law allows us to do this. Then we'll have a little over 800,000 that are left over that we want to apply to the two following years. Um, to do this, we need a place to actually put that money so that it can sit there until we need to use it. So as part of this year's school ballot, you will be asked to vote for the creation of an operational reserve fund for this purpose, because without that, We've got no place to put that money um, so that we can use it when those those years come up. For this to work, um, there is really only one article on the school ballot that deals with the budget. Um, it's Article 10. And if you vote yes on this article, it does three things for us. Um, the first thing that it does is it allows us to expend $21.1 million on education, um, on educating our students here in the district. And it's important um, to recognize that we're not asking for $21.1 million from the taxpayers. We have to state what we are go going to expend on the students. Um, and we're asking for $19.4 million from the taxpayers. The remaining amount that gets us up to that 21.1 million actually comes from federal grants and the surplus money we're planning on using, right? So we have to we have to ask the taxpayers to expend the total amount of money that we're going to spend, but not all that money is coming from the taxpayers. Some is coming from federal grants, and um, some of it is coming from from the surplus. Right? The second thing, voting yes on Article 10 will do is it creates that operational reserve fund that we, we talked about so that we have the place to hold the surplus money in so that we can use it in 2022-23 and 2023-24. And then the last thing that it does is it puts uh, the remaining surplus money into the reserve fund. Now, just so folks understand, um, once that money goes into that operational reserve fund, because you have voted on its purpose there, we cannot use it for anything else. I do not have direct access to it. The district does not have direct access to it. Um, the school board, you know, at the time that we want to use it to surplus the, the budget for those two years, um, I have to go to the school board um, in writing, uh, tell them, you know, what we're going to use the money for and how much we want. And then the school board has to review it and vote it in. So there are lots of controls in place over what this money can be used for. So I'm going to stop here for a moment. I don't think we probably have uh, any, but if there are any questions out there that, that folks want to ask, please turn off your mic um, and ask them. I can't physically see you while I'm presenting, but I can hear you. All right. So the next part of this presentation uh, relates to the impact that changes in the common level of appraisal um, from one year to the next has on your tax rates. Um, we talked a little bit about this at the very beginning. I said I was doing some pre-teaching here about the fact that you know school, school taxes come from um, fair market value. Um, CLA changes, common level of appraisal changes can cause dramatic swings in your tax rates from year to year but don't really change what you physically pay in taxes um, by very much. Um, 
So it's real important to understand this as folks um, can see a dramatic change, right, in your tax rates. But that doesn't mean that the tax bill that you have to pay is going to change a lot. Typically, if your tax bill is changing on the school side of things, it's because we've changed um, something in the school budget that's having an impact. Or we lost a lot of students in terms of enrollment, um, which hasn't been the case in recent years. So I'm going to give you the, the overall piece here, and then I'm going to go into detail for those that may, may be a little bit more interested in the mechanics behind those CLA changes. Um, but in terms of your tax rates for next year, right? Again, it's important to realize that school taxes are based on fair market value of properties and not the town's assessment used in the grand list. Um, if fair market values fall from this year to next year, tax rates will increase. Um, and this is the situation across the three towns. So if you look at Braintree at the very end, right? Last year, um, your fair market assessed value was 109.44%, which means that your the houses in general um, were selling for 9.44% over what the town assessed those houses to sell for. And you can see that that fair market value has dropped, right? Last year, you were 9% above. Of, um, this year, you're down at 1.13% above. And whenever you get a decrease like that, um, what that means is that your tax rates are going to go up, but the value of your home has gone down. So what's really happening is that you're paying more in taxes on the value of your home, but your home has less value. So the end result is that, you know, regardless of these fluctuations, in terms of the CLA changes, what you pay is about the same. Your tax rates will change. You will pay more this year um, because of changes to the school budget. How much more will you pay? Well, I showed you at the very beginning, you're gonna pay 1.5 uh, cents more per $100 of assessed value of your homes, um, fair market value, um, which adds up to about $41 on the annual tax bill um, for the average priced home of $275,000. So in Braintree, you know, your tax rate, um, 90, you know, 11.5 cents of it is due to CLA changes um, you're going to be paying, you know, 13 cents more per hundred dollars of assessed value of your, your property. Um, and this is because your fair market values have gone down considerably. So again, you're paying more, right, on your property, um, on the value of your property, but because the value of the property has gone down, it balances out. In Brookfield, you'll be paying three cents more, right, because they didn't have as big a shift um, in their fair market values between last year and this year. Um, so 1.5 uh, cents of that, you're going to be paying more um, in your tax bills, right? About 41 bucks for the average, uh, average uh, priced home. Um, the other part is due to these market fluctuations, fair market fluctuations. In terms of Randolph, um, in terms of your tax rate, you'll be paying 0.4. Um, so 4 cents more per $100 of assessed value. Um, but that's because the fair market values of your homes have gone down, you know, moderately when the, the, the state did its uh, equalization um, survey. So, again, what people can expect on the average cost, average cost home of $275,000 is about a $41 increase in the actual tax bill that you pay. So... In terms of school tax rates, um, we can go into a little bit more detail here besides the, the nudgy way that I just described um, things. Um, when you pay your property taxes, uh, you're actually paying a small amount in taxes to the town, right? There's town taxes. And in terms of the town, they calculate things differently than the school taxes. The much larger amount in taxes that you pay um, are taxes to support the schools um, through the education fund. And this discussion is not about town taxes. Um, this discussion is about the school portion of those taxes. So if we're spending more on the schools, it should make sense that what you pay in your school taxes increases as well, the actual you know, check that you write out uh, at the end of the year. Changes to your tax rates um, that are due to an increase in the school budget will definitely increase how much you physically pay in school property taxes. 
What's interesting is that the part of your tax rate that changes uh, due to the fluctuations in the common level of appraisal typically do not change what you physically pay. And then we're going to look at a specific example here. And the example that we're going to look at is uh, Braintree. And these use actual common levels of appraisal and tax rates for Braintree. So they're actual numbers um, in here. Um, so these formulas, it's important to recognize that I'm simplifying them. The formulas actually use the town's grand list amounts, uh, but for simplification, it's easier to pretend that the grand list amount is the cost of the average home in Vermont of $275,000. So the town has assessed your home's value to be $275,000, and that's used for your town um, to determine your town's um, taxes. The state, on the other hand, does a study each year called this equalization study to determine the fair market value of your home based on what homes in your area have been selling for. This current year, 2020 slash 21, which is in the navy blue there, the state has said that the fair market value of your home is actually 9.44% greater than the town's assessment. And so the state for school property taxes um, purposes is going to tax you on that value. So, right, you know, if your town's assessed you at 275000 and you increase that by 9.44%, the fair market value of your home is $300,960. So the town last year um, when it was doing this that set the tax rate for $100 of the value of your home at $1.47. That means that for every $100 of value of your home, you're paying $1.47 in taxes. And your tax bill would have been around $4,430. This year, something happened. You can see that the common level of, a, of appraisal um, has gone down, right? It was 109 last year. Um, it's gone down to 101. What does that mean? It means that um, the fair market values of your homes have dropped by about 8%. And so what the state did in response to that is they actually increased the tax rate on your home or will increase the tax rate on your home because this is for next year. So based upon this assessment, right, um, fair market value for your home is actually $278,108 at a tax rate of $1.61 per $100 of value, your tax bill will be $4,471 or in that ballpark um, this coming year, right? So basically you're gonna pay $41 more this year and that number should sound familiar, right? Um, so again, you see this whopping change in the tax rate in Braintree by 13.5, um, cents per hundred dollars of value, but in reality, um, the only thing that's really impacting your actual tax bill, what you pay, um, is the impact that the, the school district budget uh, had on things. And that impact is, is about 1.5 cents per hundred dollars of assessed value. So we go back to, you know, where we started here is this idea that, you know, while the changes in, in the common level of appraisal can cause your tax rates to fluctuate wildly, they really don't change the amount you ha have to write out for your check when you pay your school property taxes. Only increases in your tax rates that are directly due to changes in the school budget are going to change how much you physically have to pay. Based on the current property yield being voted on by the legislature, your effective tax rate, that it's effective tax rate is that which changes what you pay, um, will increase by about 1.5 cents per $100 of assessed property value. Um, and on the average home, um, you know, you're gonna see an increase of about 41 bucks. Just uh, show a little bit more um, in terms of where we stand, um, right? Total budget. Total expenditures that we're looking to expend on student learning next year is 21.1 million. Remember, we're only asking for 19.4 million um, from the local taxpayers. The rest of that money is uh, grant money and money from the surplus. Um, this is assuming a property yield for those that are really into the tax game of $10,998. 
Um, and that is what is currently working its way through the legislature right now. When we did these presentations a little bit earlier in the year, um, the state uh, was worried uh, and re reasonably so that given COVID, they weren't gonna have as much in the education fund. And so the initial uh, property yield that they had us used was like 10,763. Um, and so this is a real good improvement um, in terms of benefiting you know, all the districts across the state that the property yield is that. Um, we are gonna use $826,342 um, in surplus to offset the budget. Um, that means that what we're asking for the from the taxpayers is actually a decrease of 1.56% from last year. Um, one of the things to be aware of is that uh, we always want to keep below what they call the spending threshold. Um, the state this year does not want to see districts spending more than $18,789 per student. If a uh, district spends more than that, there are severe penalties um, that a district will incur in terms of taxes for, for exceeding that threshold. And so what we're looking at right now is um, based upon the numbers that we have, uh, we're paying 17,885 per student for next year. That's that's what our budget is calling for, which is actually a reduction from last year. Last, last year, we actually paid $109 more per student than we will next year. So we've got a pretty good buffer there um, that's in place. Um, these pieces are kind of uh, not as important, but I'll throw them out there because we talked about them um, in earlier meetings in pay, case people are interested. Um, Raven, um, that budget has already been approved. Um, Raven is a in-house program um, that we run that serves um, our students that are in need as well as students from other districts and there is a tuition um, to attend that program, um, which will be $26,693. Uh, next year, which is significantly less um, than if these students were sent out to other other programs, probably at least thirty to sixty thousand dollars less. Um, the tuition rates at RTCC have gone down um, for next year by about a hundred dollars. Um, if a person from outside the district um, who does not have an elementary school in their district chooses one of our elementaries um, for school choice. Um, the district will pay $14,866 to send that student here. Um, for the high school um, for next year, if uh, again, if we have students coming in through school choice, um, the cost of the tuition to the district that is sending the student here will be $18,630. And that is about it, unless there are questions out there. Since it's just Orca Media and two of my board members who've heard this presentation before, I don't believe there's probably questions. Um, it is a little stale trying to do a presentation when you don't have people standing in front of you. Um, it's more, more fun to have some interactions and some questions, but hopefully, you know, if this plays on Orca Media, um, people are gonna see it. And if it generates any questions, shoot me an email. Um, tomorrow, I will be sending out the line item detail of the budget um, so that everybody can have it. Um, as well as I'll send out again our annual report for people to look over. Um, and so I think that, that that'll be useful information. And again, you know, the vote is on March 2nd. We really are hoping that folks um, can come out and vote for this budget because we've, we've done our homework in trying to reduce taxes for folks. Um, but being able to use that surplus money um, to lower taxes, you know, for three years in a row does require that vote so that we can create that operational reserve fund to put the money in and to hold it, um, you know, for the, the success of two years after next year. So that's going to be really important. And again, the other thing uh, I want folks to remember is that uh, we have to state in the ballot how much we will be expending on students next year. But what we are expending on students comes from multiple places. 19.4 um, million is coming from the taxpayers. The remaining amount is coming um, primarily um, from the federal grants that we receive, so that doesn't affect local taxpayers, and the surplus, which already affected lo local taxpayers but last year um, to help subsidize things. Um, so with that, I'm going to sign off, and I appreciate it. And again, folks that are watching on Orca Media, if there's questions, um, shoot me um, an email. 
um, I'll answer what I can. And if it's something that's deeper into the budget that I can't answer, um, I'll make sure that Robin Pembroke, our uh, business manager, um, gets a hold of you and can talk you through it. So thank you very much. Take care. Thank you, Lynn.